I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Duluth's Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial is the only one of its kind and this week it was named a Heritage Preservation Landmark. Now the timing coincides with upcoming Remembrance events. Did you know that homeowners can play a role in stemming floods? Our guest has some tips to keep runoff out of local lakes and streams. And we'll have the week's top business stories and see what was making news 25 years ago. It's all coming up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. The official beginning of summer is still a week away, but we had a sneak preview today, Denny. It was a day of beautiful sunshine, but watch out for the weekend. <laughs> Could be a, it's going to be a wet one. Yeah, I hope you made it to the cabin. Yeah, yeah okay. Well, <laughs> not, not long enough. <laughs> All right, we All do right. have some interesting topics this week, so let's get started. All right, thank you very much, Julie. Welcome, everyone. This Sunday, June the 15th, marks the 94th anniversary of a terrible event in Duluth history. On that day in 1920, three young black men were falsely accused, taken by a mob from the old Superior Street Jail, and lynched at the corner of 1st Street and 2nd Avenue East. Today, the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial is located at that corner. The memorial is the only one of its kind in the nation, and this week it was named a heritage preservation site by the City Council. Joining us now to talk about that and the Day of Remembrance events is Jody Broadwell, the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial Committee Chair. Julia Chang is a Clayton Jackson McGee board member, and Dick Dolezal is a co-founder of the CJM Memorial and is an emeritus member of the board. Thank you all for being here. Jody, why is the preservation landmark status so important? Uh, we think it's important because it will give the memorial a protection plan or a heritage preservation plan and that will outline how the memorial will be preserved forever. Mm -hmm. Dick, now you were involved way at the beginning, I, I understand, in getting the uh, Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial off the ground. Um, talk about why it was important to you and those, uh, those co-founders to really tell this story and, and make sure that it wasn't forgotten in the community. Hmm. Well, in 2000, um, a woman, a journalist named Heidi Bach Hansen uh, wrote for the Duluth Ripsaw, and she had researched and done a story on the lynching, and as the first time I'd ever heard of it, and I'd lived here since 1972, mm -hmm. uh, and I decided to. There was talk of a of a meeting that night, a vigil, uh, there at the corner where they were lynched, and I went down to it, and just a, a number of us said that we ought to at least have a plaque here. What's hard is to know that a terrible thing happened. And yet there's not, no mention of it, you don't learn of it, and, and I'm a believer of, of we need to learn, from, know our history so we learn from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I just met a yeah. number of other people that said yes. <laughs> Dick, I came to Duluth in 1969, and just a few years later, very early 1970s, I had not heard of the lynchings either, and I discovered that these had taken place, uh, this event had taken place, and so what I did was I wrote a story for television, not a long story, but I, I was deluged with nasty phone calls and letters uh, raking me up one side and down the other for opening a wound, opening a sore. We've come a long way from then. People now are willing to talk about it. Back then they wanted to forget about it. Yes. What's happened with us? Well, I think the idea is certainly right after, you know, right after the lynching, you stopped hearing about it in Duluth. The papers just quit talking about it. and. And um, it, it was felt, I guess, best to, uh, to yeah. hide it. The men were buried in unmarked graves even. They, they for right. feared that they'd be desecrated. And uh, 40 years ago, uh, people were still alive here in Duluth who probably witnessed those lynchings. Yes. 
we're at the scene. And I think that makes a big difference mm -hmm. as, as you're trying to look into and do things about it. Mm -hmm. Julia, the memorial has been around for 11 years now. Has it made a difference in the community? I think it's really important, um, the role that it plays here. Um, it is the only memorial of its scale to victims of lynching. Um, one of our models is bring the truth to light. So we, we can't heal, we can't reconcile, we can't learn from the mistake if we're hiding from it. Um, I, I think of that memorial as um, a haven in a very difficult neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And you know, in all the years that it's been here, it's, to me it's, it's remarkable how, how little graffiti, I mean, maybe there's been one instance where mm -hmm. my spouse and I have had to go over and clean graffiti off of the walls. Uh, we see people picking up litter there. Uh, you know, we have a garden cleanup every spring, and you know, we 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 do pick up some cigarette butts and some some trash. We pull up a lot of weeds, uh, but later on in the summer, you know, we, we see people people bringing almost gifts. You know, some sometimes people will bring some pebbles and line them up on the walls. Uh, somebody remarked to me one time that he really liked that we had planted some chives there, and those were a gift from one of our longtime supporters, um, Bill Hardesty. We took some chives from his garden, and they're still growing there. Mm -hmm. Has it helped the community make strides in terms of racial justice? Well, I, I think so. Uh -huh. I think we have, you know, we, we also developed a, a curriculum, and, and we have two DVDs we did that dealing with racism. So we, we keep trying to talk about this in sure. big voice, and by, by by putting it out in the open as we did, I think people found that talking about it helped. Mm -hmm. Helped with their feelings of whether it was guilt or uh, on the white community mm -hmm. to be able to, for us to be able to talk about this and say, yeah, we did this and we want to make sure it doesn't happen again and, and we need to look at what was happening and what's happening today so that we don't, we don't uh, allow it to happen. I don't know how much written history there is on that sad event. To your knowledge, uh, were any of the family members, relatives of the three who were lynched here notified of their deaths? And do we know if there are any family members still alive today? I'll, yeah. I'll start with that, or do you want to? Um, you can go ahead. The, um, the three men, well, okay, they worked for the John Robertson cir uh, circus, the circus. And back then, they were really not almost human. They, they barely had their names recorded. So when they died here, uh, we didn't even necessarily know their names. There weren't IDs, and none of the families were notified. Um, Elmer Jackson's family learned about it through the press. Really? Um, and, um, and he was from down in Missouri. Uh, but no, no. One of the family members did, he, when he came to identify the body, um, he was actually charged by the city, no. for, for or by the undertaker for for uh, bringing the body up, and it was uh, he was supposed to collect money that was owed him under the law, and he never got that either. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Do we know if any are still living today, or have any ever been here to see the memorial? Yes, yes. Is that what you were going to talk about, Julia? Um, let's see. What year was that? I think it was the the ninetieth anniversary. Um, uh, one of uh, Elmer Jackson's second cousins, a distant relative, um, mm -hmm. uh, joined us here. There was a, um, a man who wrote a book uh, named uh, The Lyncher in Me. Is Michael oh, Fetal. Yeah, no, no, it was the Warren uh, Reed. Warren oh, Reed. Warren. Oh, Warren. Yes, that's right. Um, that was his they, um, a man named Warren Reed published a book um, a few years back. Uh, he w always wondered why nobody would ever talk about his family, and so as he dug into his genealogy, he discovered that uh, I think it was his grand great grandfather was one of the fomenters of the lynch mob, and uh, he uh, attended the dedication mm -hmm. here in 2003, in October of 2003, and then he returned here um, for the um, 90th anniversary observations, and he was joined by Elmer Jackson's cousin. We have some photos uh, from that event. So yes, uh, they um, they were both here in, in uh, 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 what year was that? 2010, mm -hmm. and uh, um, Virginia brought some acorns. 
from uh, an oak tree mm -hmm. in Pennytown. And uh, Warren and his partner, they live in Washington State, um, they propagated some seedlings from <coughs> these acorns and we've planted them in the cemetery um, near the graves. Hmm. Isn't that something? <laughs> Jody, now there are some events coming up next week to, to commemorate the, the anniversary. Talk about that and, and how the community is going to uh, memorialize it again. So each year we do an annual day of remembrance. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's a whole week of remembrance. Uh, this year there'll be two days. Uh, we'll start on Sunday, June 15th on the anniversary with a gathering up at the cemetery, uh, Park Hill Cemetery. It'll be at 6 p.m. and that's a very a uh, small kind of informal gathering where people just come together. We lay flowers and we talk and we, we remember the men. And then um, on Monday, June 16th, we'll have a gathering at the memorial itself. And uh, that's a much larger gathering. And the mayor will come and officially announce the local landmark nomination. So that'll be exciting. And we have uh, some other speakers lined up. Tanisha Munio, who is our 2014 scholarship recipient, will be there. And Natasha Lancor is going to speak, as well as Stefan Witherspoon. And then following the event will be a reception at the Building for Women from 1 to 3, and that's where our board meets. So we're just inviting people to come, mm -hmm. have some food, we'll have some cake and kind of a celebration. And then later on in the evening from 6 to 8.30, there will be a, a book signing and a book reading with Elizabeth Dorsey Haddle, who wrote uh, The Ku Klux Klan in Minnesota. And so that will kind of sum up our our events for this year. When Mr. Clayton Jackson and McGee were lynched, there was a mob of about 10,000 people watching this. Would you like to replicate that someday, have 10,000 perhaps at a day of remembrance? We are actually thinking and talking about doing a march in 2020, which would be the 100th anniversary of the lynching, and trying to gather about another five or 10,000 people to, to march on that day. Get the same size crowd. Yeah. Well, that'd be something. Mm -hmm. now, the region is not widely known for historic racism, you know, compared to some other parts of the country. Was this an isolated incident, or, um, you know, how active was that that Klan presence in our region? Well, in that time in 1920, there was a record amount of mm -hmm. lynchings that happened all over the country, and. What's great is that Elizabeth did write this book, and in Minnesota, not long after the lynching happened, there was 51 chapters of the KKK. Wow, that's a that's pretty. Here in Minnesota. Here in Minnesota. Isn't that something? Yeah. Wow, that uh, really is. Yeah. Well, we really want to thank all of you for being here. You've uh, shed some new light on on what is taking place, and uh, we certainly uh, wish uh, all the success with the upcoming event too. So, thank you all. Thank Appreciate you. it. Now, let's dig into our news file archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. With the signing of a deed with the DM&IR Railroad, St. Louis and Lake County Regional Railroad Authority became official owners of a scenic North Shore line. Almost simultaneously, regional railroad officials signed a contract with Trains Unlimited, owners of a dinner car, one of two trains that will begin next year carrying passengers up the North Shore. The second train is this diesel-powered Bud car from Duluth. It was christened today as an excursion line that will run between the Glensheen Mansion and Duluth throughout the summer. But what's a train without riders? And today, dressed in bright engineer bandanas, the governor, lawmakers, and others boarded the train and took a short trip down the tracks. It's hoped that the two trains combined will draw a lot of passengers and bring millions of dollars into the area. There's plenty of optimism that the area, once dominated by the sounds of train whistles and the bustle of adventurous travelers, will echo again on the lakeshore breezes. John Gagnon, Katie Lights News.
Heavy rain in parts of northern Minnesota Thursday led to localized flooding in areas north of Duluth, adding to what has been a very soggy spring. Some places received more than three inches of rain in 24 hours, causing some to flash back to the big flood in June of 2012. Ironically, Minnesota Sea Grant was holding an open house in Duluth Thursday, showing how individual homeowners can reduce runoff from their property and help stem the flow of future flooding. Joining us now is Hillary Sorensen, climate change extension educator with the Sea Grant program. And Hillary, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. What what lasting, before we get into some of the things that people can do, what lasting impacts did the, the flood of 2012 have on our local watershed? I think it was mostly just a bit of an eye opener. I mean, we've had floods in the past, 1972, mm -hmm. late 1800s. There have been a series of these, but I think that it was just in the minds of a lot of people that we don't get flooding like this. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not something that happens here. So of course, we saw a lot of damage in June, June 2012. I believe citywide, it was about $55 million in damages. In the Chester Creek watershed, where our study was mm -hmm. focused, it was about 1.7 million. Um, so just the the sheer impact on our infrastructure and not just that buildings and roads but on the the watershed the the recreational uses of that the value the kind of non-market yeah. value that we put on on our local watersheds in Duluth. So Hillary there are some things the populace of Duluth can do to prevent flooding in and around their home what what are some of the ideas that have been surfacing. Sure, so some of the big issues that we face with our rivers and streams is the is the flood volume, the, the peak flow, which is the amount of water flowing through a, a place at a, at a given time, mm -hmm. a particular location at a given time. And so it's really measures to reduce that flow. So in any sort of neighborhood or area, if you've got roofs or parking lots, uh, driveways, streets, you're gonna have a lot of runoff that's getting dumped right into the sewer systems right into our streams, deteriorating water quality, et cetera. So really what the measures that we're talking about with green infrastructure are anything to, to store that water, to keep it from, to slow down that volume, to keep it from running straight into the sewer system. So we're talking about things like rain gardens, mm -hmm. installing a rain garden on your property, uh, green roofs and blue yeah. roofs, uh, rain barrels. Rain using. barrels were popular at one time, decades ago, all of a sudden they disappeared. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why, and yeah. now they're back. <laughs> you brought some show and tell with you. Yes, yeah, so this is an example. We've got some perme uh, permeable pavers that can be used for streets, driveways, any of this stuff. And it's it's using impermeable things like cement and brick um, that's over a grid with things like gravel and sand. So that allows the water to actually flow straight through um, into the soil instead of being dumped right into I the see. sewer system. So we have we have a lot of this actually around the city of Duluth. On UMD, ah. there's a, an example of this yeah. too. I'm dumping ice all over the place. <laughs> so there isn't um. runoff. There isn't runoff then from your driveway. Right, it's, exactly. It, it so you're, you're the limiting soil. that runoff. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. You mentioned rain gardens, and mm -hmm. some people might not be familiar with with what that is. Can can you? Tell people what a, what a rain garden is and what distinguishes it from just a normal garden. Sure, so a lot of the time you're using native vegetation, um, mm -hmm. so things that are gonna do well here, and it's, it's using this type of vegetation that's going to help to store that water. So it's going to really be something that absorbs that intense rainfall that we, that we yeah. tend to get around here to keep it from, again, being dumped straight up. I've heard the term the green rook, what is that? Green. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping it's a green roof. Oh, roof. <laughs> okay. All right. Green yeah, that's roof. I think what we're okay. talking about is a okay. green roof. Yes. All right. when I, it was misspelled when I saw it. So, okay. Oh. Thank you. Uh, what is a, a green roof though? Sure, so that's going to be a roof that's meant to hold water and it's going to be either partially or entirely vegetated. So it works with insulation, it helps to uh, mm -hmm. improve water quality, it helps to store and absorb that water. I know of a couple in town. Are they getting more popular? They are. They are definitely getting more popular. Um, I, I think that's a, something that we're going to see more of in this area, especially with you know, temperature changes and precipitation yeah. changes in the future. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you you had a, an open house last night. Yes. A lot of people attend, and was there a lot of interest in this? Yeah, it was fantastic. We were very happy with it. This study has been going on for about a year and a half now through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Coastal mm -hmm. Services Center, and they came out with this report, and we really wanted to talk about um, the process that was used to look at land use and look at precipitation and look at how, how flooding is happening in the Chester Creek watershed specifically, but the process could be transferred to other area watersheds. Um, so to look at what types of things not only can we do as individuals, as property owners, but some of the things that Duluth can do um, at, at, the, Paul, at the planning, uh, how we do future land use development and planning and how we want to preserve green spaces and wetlands that we have in our Would it watersheds. help to eliminate some of our lawn and then put plants yeah, native, Instead, yeah, native definitely. Plants. Native plants is definitely a way to go. Grasses and tree planting along streets, any of that, it does a lot holds for a, holds holding soil water together. water storage. Mm -hmm. Is there funding available for a community like Duluth or for individual home owners to invest in some of this green infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I'm not entirely sure about individual homeowners mm -hmm. funding, but uh, the EPA, for example, has come out with a few few different green infrastructure grants, one of which I think the city of Duluth actually has to do some green infrastructure implementation in the St. Louis River watershed. And there are a lot of related interest and projects going on, uh, not only at the community scale, but, but with homeowners and individuals. We're expecting to get some more, maybe even heavy rains this weekend mm -hmm. in various parts of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. What's a quick fix? A quick fix. <laughs> Is there rain barrels probably, uh, rain barrels or to divert the water away from your house. Yes, so diverting your downspouts, rain barrels, again, anything to store and re reuse that water to keep it from being dumped straight into the sewer system. You mentioned uh, a lot of the damage that came from the flood of 2012. Mm -hmm. um, that damage, has it made our watershed you know, perhaps more vulnerable to future flooding because so much washed away? Uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Stream bank erosion was one of the biggest things that we saw in Chester Creek with the damages in culverts. It wasn't so much damage to buildings in that particular watershed, but that the clay soils that we have over bedrock with the intense velocity of that flow, uh, definitely our watersheds are more vulnerable to flooding, especially when the soils are pre-saturated. If we've had rain weeks before, one more really heavy rain event that's that's kind of how we get they them do the here. Job on it, they yeah. do the job. <laughs> <laughs> what do you hope comes out of the the study and these follow up meetings that you're having? It's really about just linking all of these people together with the tools and resources to address some of these issues. So it's talking about awareness that you know we do get these intense rainfall events, but there are things that we can do as individuals, as a community, to reduce the damages from those. Um, we do have a lot of green space in our areas, so preserving. That that, preserving our wetlands as well as implementing some of these uh, green infrastructure measures really goes a long way. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Hillary Sorensen from Minnesota Thank Sea you Grant, so thank, thank you for you. coming Appreciate in. It. Appreciate it. Thank Very you. enlightening. Thanks. Thanks. It's time now for the week's business news from Business North. The Itasca County Board has amended agreements with the state of Minnesota, giving Esser Steel an additional year to spend public money on construction. The state allocated $66 million for infrastructure to support the mining development near Nashwalk. The work includes road improvements, railroad track, electrical substations, natural gas studies, sanitary sewers, and potable water extensions. Through the sale of high-yield bonds, Esser recently raised $450 million to finance the next phase of construction for its $1.7 billion mine and pellet processing plant. 
After 33 years in medicine, 20 of them in executive leadership roles, Dr. Peter Person, Essentia Health's chief executive officer, has announced plans to retire in 2015. Essentia's board of directors will begin a national search for his replacement. Dr. Person joined the Duluth Clinic as an internist in 1981 and soon began splitting his time between clinical practice and administrative roles. He was named Duluth Clinic President in 1995 and became the CEO of the St. Mary's Duluth Clinic Health System in 1997. He continued seeing patients until 2000 when he moved to administration full-time after obtaining his MBA from the University of St. Thomas. Construction work is half complete on the Shawamigan Food Co-op's expanded Ashland Grocery Store. The building has undergone extensive renovation to make it more energy efficient. The co-op currently has about 2,000 square feet of retail space. With the expansion, that space will triple to 6,000 square feet. It will allow the co-op to stock more local products, including produce, fresh meat, and fish. Completion is set for September. For more on these and other business stories, visit businessnorth.com. And speaking of business news, this week we sent a video crew out to one of Duluth's newest businesses, the Vikra Distillery in Canal Park. The distillery is the passion of husband and wife team Joel and Emily Vikra. After careers on the East Coast, they decided to jump into the craft distillery business, building out a space in the Pellucci building adjacent to the Aerial Bridge. Their gins are already winning craft distilling awards and gaining customers. Emily Vikra told us how they decided to take the plunge. We had this moment where we were like, well, wait a second. Minnesota has amazing green, best water in the world. There are peat bogs north of Duluth. Like, why isn't anyone making Minnesota whiskey? And so that idea just kind of stuck with us. So the whole thing was kind of born out of this idea of making a really northern Minnesotan whiskey. And we did a little bit of market research to see, you know, like, was this a viable business opportunity? And um, turns out craft distilling is kind of where craft beer is about 10 to 15 years ago. So it's kind of just starting to take off. And we thought, you know what, let's just, let's just do it. Let's learn how to distill. So we're starting with these gins and the Akavit, and then we're also going to craft three whiskeys that are kind of going to be our flagship lineup of spirits. So we're actually going to make a bourbon, a rye, and then a single malt uh, with peat in it, which is what inspired the whole thing. And so those will be coming in years down the road. And uh, next week, Denny, will take a tour of the Vicra Distillery and learn more about their company and their plans for oh, the future. Wonderful. Looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. If you have a comment, now's the time to call. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message, or you can send us an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org. You can also visit the WDSE website for program schedules, updates on your favorite PBS shows, and news about the station. And it's exciting to see new companies opening their doors here in the region, Julie. It is. We really are becoming uh, kind of a mecca for um, the craft, uh, craft yeah. beers and now the, the craft distilleries. We'll so. see what happens. Thank you. For Julie and the crew here at WDSC, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend, everybody, and be kind.